Should I introduce our first? Oh, there we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the, on behalf of the Home Care Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance of New Hampshire, I'd like to welcome you. I'm Eric. Um, I am a director of volunteers, chaplaincy, and bereavement at Tufts Medicine Care at Home, um, part of the volunteer uh, planning committee. Um, thank you for participating in our chat in your name, where you're from or where you're serving and your favorite fall colors. I'd love to uh, just quickly remind us of what our agenda is today. Um, we're gonna start off with Teresa Bianchi, practicing presence when encountering the unexpected. We're gonna be uh, visited by two Isaac Tesfe and Rosa Colon Coloco. And we're gonna be discussing the impact of race and racism on healthcare. And then Linda Douglas is gonna lead us in a discussion on trauma-informed care 101 and why it matters to volunteers. Um, so first I'd like to introduce to our first, uh, our first presenter, and that's Teresa Bianchi, who is a board certified chaplain providing spiritual and emotional care to persons experiencing spiritual need, especially at end of life and when facing chronic illness. She's an ordained pastoral leader, and she's currently the spiritual and bereavement coordinator at VNA of Manchester and Southern New Hampshire. So thank you for being here, Teresa, and take it away. Good morning. Everyone's I... new. <laughs> all right. That's all right. Um, I just uh, got a chance to see everybody's faces, and, and that was lovely. So um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, volunteering, our volunteers are just a special part of our team. And I am so honored and privileged to be able to be with you all today and to share about what it's like to be present when you walk into the unknown. And I have to admit that uh, in the years that I've been working in hospice, that's one of the best, greatest lessons I've learned is how to, to go in with a um, spirit of curiosity and openness to whatever uh, is there when I come in and to not have an agenda. So, um, and that has just, by being that way, uh, being open and curious and ready, open to whatever uh, is presented, it's been a, an opportunity to, um, have sacred space. And I think that's another thing that I like to lift up is that the space that is shared with a person who is facing the end of their life, uh, the connection that you make becomes a sacred space of trust and compassion and, and connection. So with that, um, I have to learn how to use my screen. I sh thought I'd share with you, I I had a chance to peek at the other um, chaplains presentations for the past few weeks. And I was pleasantly surprised to learn that they too like John O'Donohue. And I've used uh, John O'Donohue a lot in my uh, readings with uh, our hospice team, as well as uh, even with some of our folks uh, in the in, that I've met. So for a hospice volunteer in this fragile frontier place of hospice care, your kindness becomes a light that consoles the brokenhearted. And I, my hope for you today is that you may embrace the beauty in what you do and may you never doubt the gifts you bring. I, I'm going to go back for a minute and I'm going to ask you to fill in in the chat um, briefly some of the unexpected, just a brief uh, word or two, some unexpected situations you found yourself in 
uh, that have surprised you, um, that have left you uh, stressed or befuddled or whatever, if you could do that real in just a few words, that would be great. Is there a way I can see the chat? There is, but it's a little hard while you're sharing your screen. If you want to unshare your screen, you can pop it right up. Okay. Go back and forth. How's that? Too much scheduled time, not enough downtime. Um, Teresa, it is handy if you read them because our recorder won't be. Oh, able that's to true. Them. Yes. Okay. Too much scheduled time. Uh, Jehovah Witness patient navigating family dynamics, helping someone at a car accident, knowing a patient I hadn't seen for 40 years. Flu. When a patient tells me they don't want me to visit. Family members to patient assuming they know what patient wants. Greeting a family member who didn't know their loved one had passed. Young child left with a patient. The husband who shared a room with his wife liked for me to sing and play guitar, but his wife did not. Patient was lying face down on the floor when I arrived. I encountered a woman who said she was ready for life to end and frightened to die. She lasted far longer than anyone expected, fighting, fighting, fighting. These are all great. These are just what I was thinking is that we often come into situations where we don't know uh, what's going to happen and and how do you how do you face that? Here's another one. Uh, widow's fear that she wouldn't do everything right after her husband's death uh, and difficult time around the smell of death. Very, very good, very helpful to hear. Okay, um, so let's stop the chat for a little bit here, and um, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. And I thought I would share with you something that I have found to be really helpful to me in my, my um, work as a chaplain. And that is a meme that's been developed by Rashi Joan Halifax. She is a Buddhist teacher um, who runs uh, an organization in New Mexico called Abaya. And um, she developed this, um, I guess it's, I don't know if it's called a meme or, or what, but it's the word grace and each letter stands for something. And I was, um, and I thought it would be good to bring you through uh, the practice of this grace meditation um, as a way of helping you um, confront these situations that you've you've listed and, and others that you will find that you will experience in the future. Um, and it's it, initially it's a it feels like it's a long meditation, but as you practice it, um, it will become something that will be more natural and you'll be doing it as you interact with others. You'll find yourself doing it. Um, so I'd like you um, if I'd like you all to get yourself comfortable and to kind of look at this candle that you see on the photo on the uh, screen and focus on it and meditatively. And if you feel more comfortable closing your eyes, I would invite you to do that too. And as a treat, I thought I'd share with you uh, the, the meditation as presented by Joan Halifax. And someone said you liked my chimes, so I'm going to begin our meditation with chimes.
The G in grace is a reminder for us to pause and give ourselves time to get grounded. On the inhale, we gather our attention. And as we exhale, we drop our attention into the body, sensing into a place of stability in the body. We might focus our attention on the breath or on the area of the body that feels neutral, such as the soles of your feet on the floor or the hands as they rest on each other. Or we can bring our attention to a phrase or an object. We use this moment of gathering our attention to interrupt our self-talk about our assumptions and our expectations and to get grounded and truly present. The R of grace is recalling intention. We, we recall our commitment to act with integrity and respect the integrity of those whom we encounter. We remember that our intention is to serve others and to open our heart to the world. This touch-up can happen in a moment. Our motivation keeps us on track, morally grounded and connected to our highest values. Call our intention. The A in grace is about attuning, refers to the process of attunement, first to our own physical, emotional, and cognitive experience, and then to the experience of others. In the self-attunement process, we bring attention to our physical sensations emotions, and thoughts, all of which can shape our attitudes and behavior toward others. If we are feeling emotionally triggered by the person we are interacting with, our reactivity might affect our ability to perceive another with clear eyes and to care. But if we are aware of our reactivity and reflect on the nature and sources of this person's suffering, we might be able to reframe the situation in a non-judgmental and insightful way. This process of attunement and reappraisal primes the neural networks associated with empathy and supports a compassionate response. From this space of self-attunement, we attune to others, sensing without judgment into their experience. This is an active form of bearing witness. It is also the moment when we engage our capacity for empathy as we attune physically, which is somatic empathy, emotionally, 
or effective empathy and cognitively perspective taking to the other person. Through this attunement process, we open a space for the encounter to unfold, a space where we can be present for whatever may arise. The richer we can make this mutual exchange, the deeper the unfolding will be. The seat of grace is consider what will serve. This is a process of discernment that is based on conventional understanding and also is supported with our own intuition and insight. We ask ourselves, what is the wise and compassionate path here? What is an appropriate response? We are present for the other as we sense into what might serve them. And we let insights arise noticing what the other might be offering in this moment. We consider the systemic factors that are influencing the situation, including institutional requirements and social expectations. As we draw on our own expertise, our knowledge and experience, and at the same time, remain open to seeing things in a fresh way, we may find that our insights fall outside a predictable category. The discernment process can take time, and so we try not to jump to conclusions too quickly. Considering what will serve certainly requires attentional and effective balance, a deep sense of moral grounding, recognition of our own biases, and attunement into the experience and needs of the person who is suffering. Humility is another important guiding element. Grace is for engage and end, and it has two parts. The first part is engage with openness, connectedness, and discernment. The first phase in, of the E in grace is to ethically engage and act, if appropriate. Compassionate action emerges from the field we have created of openness, connection, and discernment. Our action might be a recommendation, a question, a proposal, or even not doing anything. We endeavor to co-create with the other person a moment that is characterized by mutuality and trust. Drawing on our expertise, our intuition, and insight, we look for common ground that is consistent with our values and supportive of mutual integrity. What emerges is compassion that is respectful of all persons involved, that is practical and actionable. And then part two is end by marking the end. When the time is right, we mark the end of our time in this compassionate interaction so that we can move cleanly to the next moment, to the next person or task. This is the second part of the E of grace. Whether the outcome is more than we are expected or disappointingly small, we should notice 
and acknowledge what has transpired. Sometimes we have to forgive ourselves or the other person, or this can be a moment for deep appreciation. Without acknowledgement of what has taken place, it can be difficult to let go of this encounter and move on. And so the thought came to me as I was preparing this is we release, we let go, and we breathe out. We blow out the candles. Now, let's take a moment and take a break. Breathe in, breathe out. And we move from this meditation to recognizing what Joan calls the edge states in the Halifax model of compassion. The five edge states or the non-compassionate components of grace, which help make up compassion and courage for us, include altruism, empathy, integrity, respect, and engagement. Compassionate presence, includes these five things. And as you can see at the engagement, I put down ending because it's two parts. Compassionate presence are, these five things are non-compassion elements that are usually present in all of our interactions. And they are used as resources for being compassionate and present and courageous and taking courageous action that we can draw upon. However, we may find ourselves stressed at times and compassionate presence that is stressed um, can lead to our response being the opposite of what we want. When we are stressed, we can fall off the edge of these states and slip into distortion and misperception. So Joan Halifax calls these edge states because we can go either way if we slip off of them. It's interesting, um, a lot of this is taken from her book called Standing at the Edge, Finding Freedom Where Fear and Courage Meet. Um, I put it on, as a link on your uh, handout. Um, and she has a picture of a cliff. I don't know if you can see this. Oftentimes, it, it feels like a cliff to, that we are on when we are in these edge states. And if we slip off of them, the following can happen. Altruism can become pathological altruism. Empathy can become over-identification with the other, resulting in, in empathic distress or disengagement. Integrity. When we witness or participate in acts or systems that violate our integrity or our sense of justice or benefi beneficence, we experience what is known as moral distress, which is a form of uh, PTSD. Respect can become loss of respect or disrespect which violates regard 
and trust. So the way we regard the other and the trust that we have is betrayed. Engagement. When it is, engagement becomes bad uh, when it is overwork. When in, you're in a toxic workplace or a toxic setting, or it lacks efficacy, purpose, or meaning. Engagement gone wrong can lead to burnout and collapse. I think a few years ago, I heard uh, Rashi Joan Halifax um, present at a conference I was at. And I was struck by her insight. We often talk about compassion fatigue. And she talked about um, compassion should be energizing. What we're talking about, she says, is not compassion fatigue, but empathy fatigue, mm -hmm. when we become too attached. And so I would encourage you to consider this and um, keep that in mind, that being compassionate mm -hmm. can energize us in the, in the encounter. But when we become empath, when our empathy becomes more um, trying to fix it or trying to, um, we find ourselves identifying with them more, um, then it becomes, we, we find ourselves heading towards a burnout. We don't take time to regroup and reground ourselves also. Self-care is so important in this work of compassion that we do. So I all, I think, yeah, in closing, I would like to share something from Ram Das. Um, before he died, he did a cooperative effort with uh, Mirabai Bush, um, his one final last book, and it was called Walking Each Other Home. And it was all about being with dying. And so I share with you a few um, thoughts that he shared about what it's like to be with someone who is dying. It is hard to be with a dying person until we learn how to see what is eternal so we can be there together as souls. The need to be fully there, just being, listening, for what is needed with love and kindness. And to know that you are two human beings on the edge of the mystery, sharing your truth together. You are not your roles, you are two souls. Thank you for all you do as volunteers. Thank you, Teresa. That was a wonderful presentation. I think it's always important for us to understand our own mindset, our own heart, our own understanding when we're going in and going into unknown situations because walking over any threshold really can be an unknown territory. Um, even if you've visited before, it can be, it can be different every single time you walk in into the door. So thank you so much for um, for sharing and leading us in that time. You're welcome. Do we That's, have time? No, we don't. Oh, do we have any time for um, questions or not? Sure. We have a, if anyone has any questions, feel free to either raise your hand or you can type them in the chat. Nope, that's okay. Anybody? If anyone does come up with a question. Um, it looks hopefully. like there's some things. Yep, Rosa Colon Colocas says, thank you for your beautiful words and inspiration. 
And Tanya said, thank you, Teresa, such a nice foundation for the day. Wonderful. If anyone at any time would like to, has, uh, has a question, you can always email your volunteer manager or coordinator, or um, you can volunteer the Home Care Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance, and Leslie can probably direct it to the right person uh, to get you um, to get you an answer. Um, and Bobby said you brought new meeting to some of my past experiences. That's wonderful. It is, and there is a handout. I hope that you all are able to to grab it. And the presentation slides will be available on the conference web page. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Teresa, and thank you, everyone. We've had, I think, like 15, 18 people join within the past uh, 20 minutes. So if you wanted to, in the chat, you can put your name, where you're serving, and your favorite fall color. I'm still going to hang on to that, um, just to introduce yourself to everyone else. Um, our next pre presentation is the impact of race and racism on healthcare, and I'd like to introduce two people. Um, Rosa Colon Coloco is Tufts Medicine Senior Vice President, Chief Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Officer. Rosa has over 30 plus years in global pharmaceuticals, health systems, academia, government, and nonprofit boards. She's a former New York City Health and Hospice Senior Vice President and Chief People Officer. I love that title. Um, an entrepreneur, she founded Global Learning and Diversity Partners, LLC, a consulting practice to build inclusive and learning organizations. For most of the past decade, she served Christiana Care Health System in Delaware as Senior Vice President of its Learning Institute and Chief Diversity Officer. She received her PhD in Organizational Development and Change from Benedictine University, an MBA from Henley Business School, University of Reading, New England, uh, University of Reading, England, um, a postgraduate marketing diploma from Chartered Institute of Marketing, London, Senior Certified Professional from the Society of Human Resources Management and Certificate of Diversity Management from Georgetown University and the AHA Institute of Diversity and Health Equity. She's held academic positions as professor for practice, practice at Bowling Green State University, Georgetown University, University of Delaware, and Thomas Jefferson University. The second person I'd like to introduce is Isaac Tesfe. Uh, he's a systems director for DEI Education and Research. Isaac is an experienced consultant, diversity professional, and change agent with a demonstrated history of working across various in industries. As a veteran on the team, um, Isaac is well known to colleagues across our system, the system director of education and research. He leads an evidence-based DEI academy, creating competencies, assessments, coaching, content, and evaluation, as well as academic integration with Tufts University and GME as one of all, for all of us to grow and promote behaviors that transform culture and our, achieve equity. He holds an MBA from Clark University and a PhD from UMass Boston. It's a pleasure to have both of you here presenting um, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I, I think, Rosa, I think you are up first. Yes, I am. First of all, I want to say thank you for all you do every day. I've been in health system more than 20 years, working a lot with hospices and uh, nurses uh, that go home. So I know how, how hard the work is. So I do uh, value you, I appreciate, I'm honored to be here in front of you to share some of our work and also uh, honored to be with my partner, uh, Isaac Tesva here. So I will give a kind of an introduction uh, at a high level and Isaac will go in detail into our work. So we have a Center for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and our compass is Respect, Justice and Inclusion. So uh, we will talk about context ISA will go deeper into each element of the dimensions of diversity, cultural competence, respect, and engage you in your conversation. Please feel free while I speak to put questions in the chat and any reaction of things that you want to share. 
The next page talk about who is tough medicine. So you may wonder, uh, because we used to have a name of World Force. Some of you may know Lowell General as, as an entity. You may not know that all of us are connected as a health system. As you can see on the map, we are all across Massachusetts in many more places than you may ha have thought. And we're honored to have almost 14,000 employees that connect to our communities to serve them every day. Uh, even during COVID times that we continue to live is something that we do with honor to serve. The next page talk about our new vision. Uh, Tough Medicine as a name, as a brand is quite new. So we took over that name from World Force. And you're one of the first people that you're gonna see our new mission and vision that we just launched yesterday. So I wanna share with you something hot from the press. But I'm, at the end of the day, it's about empowering people to live their best life. And we want to reimagine what we do in a way that we advance knowledge. So we can continue advancing knowledge in every single dimension of health system and healthcare. Our vision is very aspirational. So um, previous one, I said very quickly. So our vision is to be the most, to provide the most equitable, so equity is our compass, our most equitable and frictionless healthcare experience in the world. So I know the world is a big place, but we want to be very aspirational in our mission of equity. The next page talk about our center. You wonder what do we do? So yes, we have a DNI Academy. However, that's not the only thing we do, you know, to really influence uh, and address racism in, in medicine. It, we need to become culturally competent. We need to look into what policies we have that have been around for a very long time. So what it means, those many of those policies really create inequity. So we're very committed to change policy, to change practices. So I will welcome your ideas in the future. How can we change policies with, uh, within the hospice environment or even in our veterans in a, in a, in a way to go at home to serve? Uh, we, we look into experiences and we're trying to be culturally competent, having things in different languages, having interpreters. Uh, making sure that whatever we do with interpreters is connected with EPIC. So we have health equity work. We have strategies, uh, researchers working in health equity, even looking into discrimination uh, at, at work, even discrimination within health systems. So we are looking into that from the research lens in addition to education. We have more than 150 employees connected to this strategy. We have one DNI council in uh, care at home. And we also partner with many of our physicians to make sure that if we don't include them as far and our nurses, they need to be driving this agenda. We're only the convening, we bring expertise and self-assessment and that really guide a lot of the work that Isaac will present. So he will go deeper into what do we mean by respect and things like that. I think we have another page, yes, Isaac, before I pass it to you. So some key definitions for you. I know you, you, we all have different definitions. So I wanted to ground us that what is diversity is all around differences, all about differences. It's not only about race. And I know Isaac will ground us more in there. And Roosevelt Thomas, which is my favorite author from uh, Harvard University who died two or three years ago, he invented the term diversity management and he added complexity to the definition. Isaac, no, uh, like a broken record, I love this definition because we need to add complexity because we can no harmony. We don't, we cannot stick for harmony because we are diverse. So that harmony uh, don't get us to innovation. So it's okay, the tension and a way to learn from one another and inclusion is to make sure that you, we can see you because of who you are, not to what you do. We value what you do and we value your perspective and we take the time to appreciate them. And the equity is to make sure that everybody have a chance to excel in health, regardless of your zip code. You know that by zip code, there are differences sometimes of 30 or 40 years of difference of, of living, uh, lens of living in your life. So we're, lo we're looking forward to continue working and contributing that not to be the case. So we all can have that chance to have equity in our health. Okay, I thought, and then I'm going to leave you with this definition of inclusion in terms of what does that mean to be included? So when you think about what you do and as a volunteer group, you come with many different perspectives. And 
we all like to be included. We like to be able to speak up, to be treated with fairness and respect. We want to be connected to one another. And we want to really feel that we can speak up. So we're working very hard to get to this destination. And I cannot say we're there yet, but we are very committed to make sure that people know what we strive to be. And if we're not meeting these expectations, somebody needs to say something so we can learn about it. So we can learn not to do it again. So that is my overview. I, I'm hoping that I frame in it uh, for going deeper in the conversation. And if you have any question very quickly, uh, let me know. Uh, I will be here for another five, few, few more minutes, but uh, please put in the chat and I will pass it to Dr. Tesfai. Okay, thank you, uh, Rosa, greatly appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, I do want to say I, I really appreciate it. I, I took away a couple of those nuggets from the compassionate presence. And I think I might be uh, applying uh, some of that uh, into uh, not just my personal life, but you know some of what we are doing here at Tufts Medicine. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it's a tough act to follow because that was deep and powerful. Uh, so I can only hope that we can offer something similar. And when we think about that similarity, when we think about uh, the fact that we all live and work in relatively diverse places, um, this conversation is really going to be focused more about the workplace. And so what we wanted to offer you is uh, a framework uh, that's provided by the American Association of Medical Colleges. So we know in a diverse workplace, employees are exposed to multiple perspectives, worldviews. And, and when these various perspectives combine, they often come together in rather novel ways. They often open the doors to innovation. And so when we're in space together, even as volunteers, we're contributing to that innovation. We're contributing to making decisions, making better decisions. We're, we're contributing to helping our communities feel valued and appreciated, loved, and known. And so um, this framework is really a way of reminding us that diversity, equity, and inclusion is, in fact, a central component to our abilities to create environments of excellence. And oftentimes, excellence is, e is equated to providing that culturally competent care. And so uh, one of the things that we're really um, emphasizing here at Tufts Medicine is the ability to um, share information and have those honest conversations with each other, uh, particularly when we think about um, our journeys, because we're all on our own respective DEI journeys. And so what I'd like to do is uh, just for a moment, I'm going to put into the, the chat if you're able to access your chat, we're very happy to share with you uh, this DEI journey toolkit. Uh, so that is in the chat for you now. You can download that at your convenience. But we really want to emphasize that this toolkit starts with ourselves. And I think that's really a, a central part of what we're going to share today is starting with ourselves. And a lot of the conversations that you likely have every day, a lot of the experiences that you're engaging in every day, even in this conference, we often need to think about, you know, how do we improve our work? We start with ourselves first before we think about um, going outward. And so uh, this session, or at least this, this brief conversation, is really just a platform to help us kind of engage a little deeper into ourselves so that we can eventually go through these phases of being able to improve and enhance our own uh, DEI, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, skills, knowledge, et cetera. So I'd like to, to kind of start by offering a, a, a quick snapshot of a personal story. So uh, what you see in front of you are the dimensions of identity, this is our identity wheel. Um, and when we, when we show this diversity wheel, uh, one of the things that we have, we, we really emphasize is that 
all of us come together in a variety of ways. We bring a lot of our identities with us wherever we go. Each of us are bringing some of that into our respective homes, um, centers, hospitals. And one of the things that are really important, at least for this conversation, is that some of these dimensions of our identities are more prevalent. They, they have a greater impact than others. And oftentimes, how people see you and their automatic perceptions of you have an impact on how they're going to engage with you. So uh, I, I was sharing with Eric the other day uh, a light story, um, and, it, and it's one that I, I had an experience with uh, just last night. So my father is an Ethiopian immigrant, now Eritrea, was Ethiopia then. And my mother is French, Canadian, US born. I do see a Claudette uh, in, the, in the room and my mother's name is Claudette. So I just wanna say hi, Claudette. Um, uh, so, you know, I I'm, I'm, I'm mixed, I'm biracial. And I think being the way I look, where I go, I think people engage with me in different ways. And so I think people see me as someone who automatically speaks Spanish or that I speak Portuguese, that maybe I'm from Brazil. I do get Moroccan every once in a while, Egyptian. So I occasionally have people coming and speaking Arabic to me. And so one of the things that because of those experiences, I myself begin to think, well, what's other people thinking of me, that they just automatically assume that they can engage with me in this way. And so I think, well, you know what, probably race, ethnicity, um, they probably see, you know, gender, they're looking at some of these other things that automatically assume that I would relate to them in a particular way. And so when I think about my personal experiences, one of the things that I, I find important for us as we continue to have these conversations is that how people see me may not be consistent with the way I see myself. And I think that might go so far as to say that's probably consistent with many of the people that we work with, particularly if they're in their later stages of their lives or if they're in a particular journey themselves. And so we wanted to offer you an opportunity to dive into this as a small breakout session. And so uh, I was uh, just modeling for you, uh, just a, you know, a, a light story that we could share. I'm gonna put into the chat as well, a uh, picture file. And this picture file, you can make it a lot larger if what you see on the screen is too small. So you do have that file in your chat. So please open up your chat click on it and you'll be able to open up uh, that, that photo file. And what we like to do is, is really just go in uh, and have those opportunities just to kind of talk about, you know what? I've never even thought about this before, or maybe I did, I don't know. Uh, so we're really excited to, to have you uh, go in. So we're probably gonna have four or uh, five uh, folks per room and uh, we're, we're excited. We're probably going to do this for, um, Eric, we originally think about maybe five, but I think we're, we're, we're good on time. So maybe, yeah, five, yeah, five minutes. Okay. So. All right. Was that enough time? It doesn't seem like it was. <laughs> I hope you guys had good discussions. I'm sorry if it seemed like not enough time. Um, it, it seldom is. When you start right. when talking about ourselves, we seldom <laughs> love time to do so. Yeah. Um, all right. So what I was hoping to do is to, uh, and, and Nicole, I'm sorry we, we cut you off in, in, in our group, uh, but we'd love to have someone, you know, one or two individuals um, just to kind of share maybe with some of your initial reflections or thoughts. 
Um, if there's something you want to share that was something that one of your partners had said, please make sure you have permission uh, before you share. Uh, but we'd love to hear one of your personal thoughts or reflections, just one or two of you. Do you want that in the chat or do you want them to raise their hands? Most of them are muted. Yeah, feel, feel free to unmute yourselves. Okay. Thank you, Leslie, for the reminder. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourselves. And um, I, see, I see Karen calmly is unmuted. Karen, were you, were you hoping to offer one of your thoughts and reflections? No, because our group couldn't figure out what we were doing. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be unmuted. <laughs> and she, I think, she, is it Sherry Wolf? Cherry? Were you, I saw you were just speaking, but then. I got scared and muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this is such a loving uh, community here. Um, we, we would all love. To hear from you. I'll say this, this is Laura. Um, our group, uh, we, we struggled a little bit, like what, what was our, what, what are we talking about? And then really uh, did dive into, you know, the the wheel, like thinking about all that we bring and then all that somebody else brings. And I think where we were going with this is how to reframe our language so that, that we are more inclusive when we ask questions, right? That we we just don't um, not from our assumptions that you know for instance your example we talked about if if someone's uh, complexion is different you know they could be a fifth generation you, you know like myself um, from where I'm from Eastern Europe fifth generation or whatever they could be fifth generation from from Asian descent and how do we ask the questions about and learn without saying oh where'd you come from because somebody doesn't do that to me all the time right so and then we're, we got into some other uh, DEI topics around that to just but just so really we're just exploring how do we how do we change our language such that we are open and invite that that um, partnership that you know the communion around it but not bring forward our how we grew up learning language and, and social etiquette. Thank you, Laura. In fact, um, I think you, you must have seen my next slide because that was an excellent transition to uh, where we're moving to next. So I got to check my internet connection. <laughs> all right. Uh, so absolutely. Um, when we think about how all of us come to our work every day, so whether you're going into a home, a center, a hospital, wherever we are, wherever we're going. It's important for us to remember that people are automatically making assess assessments about us just as easily and as readily as we are doing it to them. And for the record, we all do it. It's natural. We all do it. What we're trying to emphasize, and I think what Laura was beginning to, um, to really hit home is to say, because we all do it, it's important that we catch it. We have to practice catching how our natural assumptions of individuals are in, impacting the way we're engaging with them. And so part of that, uh, when, we, when we use certain languages in, in the DNI world, uh, you know, we'll use the terms cultural competence. We know that you're familiar with the terms of respect, uh, and probably, uh, and, and very likely, humility. And so uh, we're not gonna spend a little too much time here, but what I really wanna emphasize is the idea that we're all coming um, to the space together. Um, I wanna, before we transition though, um, I, I wanna recognize Joanne put into the chat a question, how do you get this new cultural perspective enacted throughout an organization? And I think, we're gonna have the uh, ability to start to answer that question. So if, the, if uh, Joanne, if you think that question is not answered, yes, please raise your hand, unmute yourself, put it into the chat and say, Isaac, let's have this answered before we end. Okay, so uh, part of that is um, the languaging piece that Laura was talking about. A lot of what we're sharing today is about improving, enhancing and elevating our cultural competence. And when we think about in healthcare, you know, cultural competence is the knowledge and the inter interpersonal skills that allow providers, volunteers, etc., to understand, appreciate, and work with individuals from cultures 
cultures other than their own. It involves an awareness and acceptance of cultural differences. It requires us to practice self-awareness, build knowledge of our patient's culture, and being able to have some type of agility or adaption of our skills to um, reflect the spaces that we're in and the people that we're working with. And so we kind of do this in two ways. We do this at the individual level and we do it at the organizational level. At our goal ultimately is to work on ourselves so that we can have self-awareness, build our own cultural competence. And when we do that individually, our community, our, our, our hospitals, the organizations we work for, they begin to deliver more culturally competent care, it provides greater equity to our patients, to their families. So at the individual level, <clears throat> when we start as individuals, with each of us working on our own self-awareness and building our cultural competence, we begin to increase our capacities for the whole organization. And so we, this diagram is a, you know, a way of kind of showing how we're starting with ourselves. After we start with ourselves, we can then begin to um, have a sense of others. And that requires that we maybe expand our comfort zones. Uh, I heard Manchester mentioned earlier. So I was born and raised in Nashua, uh, lived there for 16 years. And I recently went back. I have family in Manchester, Derry, Goffstown. And uh, when I was in Manchester, I had some friends who were visiting uh, me and they're from Long Island and very uh, different affluent um, homes and, and households. And <clears throat> we were driving through downtown Manchester and uh, one of my friends had made the comment, ooh, let's not come down here again. And I was in a moment where I wanted to say, you know, just because your background and experience is different than the people who live here in Manchester, you certainly shouldn't be, you know, having this attitude about the people you see or the conditions of the area, um, you know, and I wanted to bring attention to how their identities are influencing the way they're, they're seeing their immediate environment. And I did not. And I'll tell you, it ate at me and still does because they left thinking that it was okay to think that way and then to look down upon communities that might not share their you know, affluent suburban backgrounds. And so for me, I know I'm always on this journey, this personal individual journey of, of being able to make sense of others. And then how can I adapt my, what I know in my personal life and my professional life and not just make it just a professional. And so when we think about the organizational, we know that our communities are increasingly becoming more diverse, some faster than others, but they're becoming more diverse. And so we have a responsibility to um, build our cultural competency so that we can better assist our communities. And so that's what, and so what you see on the bottom is that organizational uh, approach and ultimately, ultimately leading to um, delivering the, the kind of care that our, our patients deserve and their families. And so that requires um, a journey. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Bobby. I appreciate that. Yes, great Mexican or shawarma restaurants. Um, <laughs> so when we think about building our cultural competence, this is what we're really saying. And, I'm, and I'll briefly talk about it. Um, so as members of of care systems, we have to practice self-examination, critical reflection, not just on our own identities, but also how might those identities have biases towards others. And so uh, we, we have to become increasingly aware of the existence of how systems may have intentionally or unintentionally marginalized in individuals based on you know gender sexual orientation race age etc and so uh, cultural awareness is really about that being intentional and being mindful about this journey cultural knowledge is really about 
um, practicing and, and, and creating opportunities for us to learn more from others. And when we're going through that process, building our own cultural competence, we must practice humility. And this is something many of us struggle with because sometimes it means that we have to say, how we've lived our lives may not necessarily be the best way that we can live our lives. There are other ways we could live our lives. And mine doesn't always have to be the best. And so practicing being open to others is really, really helpful. And I'll give you an example, a quick example. Uh, I told you my father's from Ethiopia, but after the Civil War, Eritrea. So um, I've, I've, you know, <laughs> having gone to Eritrea before, um, one of the things that um, I remember is when I would go back to visit, I, I cannot bring my U.S. world perspective and pass and make judgments on what I'm seeing, because that country is exceptionally poor. They don't have eighth an eighth of our resources. So, how they live, what they do is is how they live and what they do. And I had to practice telling myself not to put judgments on it. And it's really helpful for me to be with populations that are out of my day to day, because it just reminds me of where I am and who I am, and that everyone else is also different. So practicing a little bit of that humility, and I think that's really, really tough. Um, the other piece is uh, cultural skill when building cultural confidence is the skill. And this skill is, is really important for us, particularly given the nature of work that many of you are doing. To be, cult cultural, to be culturally skilled is, is really about the ability to, um, almost in real time, collect culturally relevant information regarding the patients and their families and being able to adjust without, uh, without being judgmental. And so that, again, that, that's something that we really need to begin to think about. And as we do that, we ask that you think about this very short acronym, ASSESS. And really what it's saying is, just make sure we're checking in with ourselves. Don't, don't put ourselves before others. Just be humble and, and be open to it, making sure that we're seeking self-awareness, we're paying attention to ourselves, we're suspending judgment, and we're really expressing the kind of compassion that we think is valuable in wherever they are in that environment. And that can vary uh, by uh, population. So there's no one size fits all in that. So that's why we have to be a little agile. Um, make sure we're supporting the kind of environment that will be welcoming. And remember, we're all in different places. So we need to start where they are. We might do this more often, so um, they probably don't. So just beginning to think about that. Uh, and then as we continue in this journey of, of building our cultural competence, we have to have that cultural desire. The desire really is to say, you know what? Uh, I realize that perhaps not everyone has had a fair shake and not having a fair shake, what is my role? in either contributing to populations not having a fair shake or what is my role in dismantling and challenging some of those um, inequities and injustices and so to answer those questions we have to just dive deeper we got to better understand our social inequalities um, think about Rosa actually uh, in her opening remarks mentioned uh, that in some zip codes, some zip, people who live in some zip codes live a lot longer than people who live in other zip codes. And it really doesn't have anything to do with their race or their gender, sexual orientation. It has a lot to do with just the fact that maybe they're living next to a dump. Maybe they're living next to wherever, right? Versus a suburban community that has um, a lot of other, you know, healthy air and space to walk, parks, etc. So uh, the encounters piece is um, seek others that you uh, otherwise you might not 
spend time with. And it's uncomfortable, truthfully, it's uncomfortable. Um, but we got to do it. Um, yeah, Bobby's adding PFAS chemicals in the water. Absolutely. Um, you know, thinking about that. Uh, and I'm looking also, uh, Bobby, on the, the question on uh, cultural database. We do have something uh, here. So Eric, I'll ask it, um, remind me afterwards. We do have some uh, information on uh, Latinx communities and how they like to engage in grieving in the, in the death process. So we can also um, share that as well. Uh, and then respect at the end of the day, we gotta do it respectfully. Um, and, and so uh, the idea of respect is not a one size fits all. The golden rule is not in fact the golden rule, it's probably the bronze rule because how I show respect to you might be different than how you would show respect to someone else. So it's not to say that yours is right or wrong, it's just different. And so being mindful of that, that different gestures, the way we show affection to others can vary uh, across our, our cultural populations. So we wanted to, um, again, uh, go into a breakout, but before we do, uh, I wanted to offer one uh, final thought, which is this concept of respect. And so when we think about respect, uh, this framework is, a, is, is just a, a simple way of thinking about how is it that I, especially if we're in palliative care, especially if we're dealing with people, who are their families who are really struggling with this, uh, you know, maybe someone's passing. You know, uh, I'm not trying, I'm going to try to say this without crying because it's been three years this month. Uh, but when my father passed away, uh, he was on his way to celebrate his uh, 40th anniversary traveling to Brazil from Arizona. Um, but he just couldn't make it uh, through the flight. So it was from Phoenix to Orlando and uh, he never left Orlando. And while he was in, in hospice for the very short period of time that he was there, uh, you know, the, the, the cultural competency that was uh, demonstrated to um, the, the community uh, down there uh, was truly appreciated. <clears throat> Probably 15, 20 people, like all coming into the same space. And death is just, it's, 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 treated differently and they were great because we had people from very different worlds <laughs> in this space flying from all over just to you know to, to to try to be there as my father was passing so i felt great i felt good about that experience because they were so welcoming and respectful of 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 um, our culture so we want to uh, go into the, the, the breakout. And, and before we do, I'm going to put into the chat the questions that uh, I'd like for us to begin to think about, which is really, um, you know, what does respect mean to you? When we think about um, the idea of respect, how about this? I feel like I show respect to others when I, and then begin to um, answer that question. And so, um, on the flip side of that, what are some common signs of disrespect that you see in people in this organization or in your communities or in your, um, uh, wherever you're volunteering? Uh, so we, we, we'd love to, to hear from you. And uh, I mean, just send this in the chat right now. And I think, Eric, are we still, are we still doing? Five? Yeah? Okay. All right. So, sorry, I typed quickly. There's a, a typo in there somewhere, but um, you have it. You're, this should travel with you in your, your chat box. It should travel with you into your breakout group. Fun watching everybody. Maureen, I think you were, you were just about to hit a home run. Oh, no! <laughs> And I lost it. <laughs> Did you lost your whole thought? You can share it with everybody. Oh no, thank you. I'm I'm fine. <laughs> right. 
All right, so we'd love to hear again, uh, and we're going to stay in this format, uh, but just to hear from uh, one or two individuals. You know, what are some of the things that came up for you when you're thinking about respect? You. And um, we'd love to, to hear from you. So again, Leslie, I remember now, feel free to come off mute, and we just want to hear from you. Uh, you can raise your hand, too, if that, if your uh, technology permits. You can do the reaction, raise hand, but uh, feel free to just go on or uh, take yourself off mute. Or type and we'll read it. Yes, that's an option as well. We had some good stuff in our group. Someone from our group wanna say one? I think you just volunteered, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think being present, uh, listening, <laughs> and being willing to be vulnerable um, when you're with uh, with a patient or with uh, with a family, and and really being open and presence is huge. Um, a non judgmental third party presence and just being there um, and listening and trying to understand um, can go a long way. Absolutely. One of the things that. Uh... I carry around with me at all times and I, I learned this through a uh, small business and then uh, at a larger business is that without uh, other the, the patient or the customers or other people we don't get by I mean uh, with the, our whole life depends on other people at so many different levels and without those interactions uh, we're done and dusted Yes, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Well, I'll, I'll add a, a summary piece here. And I, and I think it's a really good takeaway is, is that, you know, I was born and raised in Nashua. Um, my father's family was not around because uh, they were in another country. And so I was raised in a very homogenous community and I was really only with, um, you know, similar folk. And um, when I would have to go to Boston to visit some of my dad's friends, the idea of respect dramatically changes. And I had to adapt to my environments so that I was able to show respect to my elders in ways that I may not show the same respect in a more US culture. And so uh, for me, that always reminds me that there's no one 100% set standard of respect for all people. But I think um, in, our, in our group, um, Evelyn uh, offered us a really great thought. And the thought really was around meet them where the patients are. Don't try to bring any of your stuff to them. Let them come to you and use that as the bridge to establish the, the means of respect and communication and build the relationships from there. But to do that requires a bit of humility because you're putting someone else before yourself. It requires that we respect the process and the people. It requires that we open ourselves to possibility as opposed to closing ourselves off to the possibilities. And so um, if there were any real major takeaways, uh, I would certainly share that um, we all come to our spaces with different backgrounds, experiences, identities. And um, what was shared today, uh, I'm gonna hold dear to my heart. Uh, I am gonna practice some of that compassionate presence from the previous session. Uh, and, and I really want to um, say thank you for, for allowing uh, Rosa and I to join for a little bit of time in your journeys. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to put my email into the chat. If I'm not mistaken, uh, these will also be sent to you afterwards, the slides as material. So um, I just put my email address uh, in the chat. And I wish you all the best and enjoy the conference. Yeah, I've got one, th uh, one thing I'd like to add is we've got to remember the platinum rule, not the golden rule. 
treat others the way they want to be treated. Evelyn, do you agree? Okay, she said absolutely. I, I could read those lips. She said, absolutely, definitively. Well, thank you so much, Isaac and um, Rosa, for being with us today. Um, and we'll have many other volunteers that will be viewing this. So again, as a volunteer coordinator, we appreciate your time and uh, in, in sharing all of your wisdom with us. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. This is um, Linda Douglas. She's a former trauma-informed specialist with the New Hampshire Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. She's worked in the field of domestic violence, homelessness, and substance use for almost 30 years. Um, during, during her tenure, she trained organizations across the state about the impact of trauma and how to provide trauma responsive services. Uh, she is currently in quotation marks, retired and working part-time for Overcomers Refugee Services, Upreach Therapeutic Equine Program and Granite State College. Um, she loves the diversity of activities that come with retirement. And I'm happy to say she hopes to come back and volunteer with us at Granite VNA. I'd be happy, to, we'd be happy to have her. Um, and she lives in Penacook with her very loving cat. Welcome, Linda. Nice to see you. Thank you, Lisa. And that loving cat might jump up on my shoulder at some time during this presentation. <laughs> so don't be shocked when you see that happen. I want to go ahead and bring up my slide set right now. And so just go ahead and get started. Um, I'm really glad to be here. It's I, I really have a great respect for the work that is done in hospice, having seen, having seen my father through his end of life in hospice and it was just very important that this happened that it was just such a blessing to have hospice workers there for him so what i want you to do today I'm, i've got maybe about the next 45 to 50 minutes is first of all take care of yourselves it sounds like you've had a pretty busy day today and you've had a lot of good things to discuss and and all of that I'm gonna be talking about trauma. And sometimes when people hear about trauma, they start reflecting on their own past stuff. And that's not, let's say if you can put that aside today. And what I would really like to see is have you think about some people that you've been working with in hospice, where they are in their life, whether or not they are doing a life review whether or not they've reached that point where they remember things that happened 50, 60 years ago, but can't remember things that happened yesterday. All of this is gonna have an impact on how they're going to respond to you and how they're going to respond to the services and the medical procedures and everything that's happening to them in hospice. One of the big things that I want to make sure that I don't forget to say, so I'm going to say it a couple of times, is that when we recognize that someone is responding to trauma, to trauma that they've had, don't take it personally. Because what they're doing is they're responding to something that happened to them years ago, and you just happen to be the person there at the moment. And sometimes it, it can be, why are they angry at me? Or why are they, why are they having this reaction? It, it really may have very little to do with you, but with what is, is they're being reminded of in the moment. So when we're talking about trauma-informed care, it's just understanding that there's current life situations that could be contributing to the person's problems. And of course, in hospice, we know that they're all an end of life. And so again, while I'm going through this, think of the medical procedures, the things that they have to go through that they may not have any choice over. And not having choice is something that increases the level of trauma that someone has. Think of the times in your life where something was happening and you didn't have a choice. I think of COVID. I think about the loss of someone in your life, the aftermath of a hurricane or a natural, natural disaster. 
So people that we've, we're working with and we serve have had traumatic life experiences. And every once in a while, there's going to be things that we normally call triggers, but I prefer to call them activations that will cause that person to relive a trauma and see the support person or the support agency as a source of distress rather than a place of healing. And it sometimes I think it does come down to choices. And no matter, I've been to hospice house, I've, I've, I've seen how hospice works with people in their home. And I know that the intent is not to create distress. And that's why I say, you know, don't take it personally, but still when you've, when you're recognizing that someone is experiencing distress, talk to somebody, talk to the social worker, talk to your supervisor, talk to Lisa, just to be able to process through what is happening. I'm going to give you an example. I have a friend who's a hospice social worker, and she told me a story about a woman with whom she was working who would get up and get out of her room and just roam up and down the halls. And they needed to have an LNA with her or a, a volunteer to just walk her up and down the halls. And somebody said, well, how can we document that? Is that really a service that we need to provide? I mean, she should, why do we have to do that? And what my friend said to them, found out from the daughter is this woman had experienced domestic violence. And one of the things that she had done while experiencing this is that she, in order to relieve her anxiety at times, she would just get up and walk around the house and just go from one thing to another. So she was reenacting this in the nursing home by walking up and down. Just that was how she handled the anxiety that came with the trauma. And so the social worker made the, made the comment that it is providing a service. What it is, you are supporting someone in attending to their trauma response and helping them relax and feel less tension. So you may not, it, it's really about being able to understand how these things can happen. So what we want to do is be able to use people's strengths, give them those choices in their treatment, collaborate with them, their families, healthcare staff, develop safety. These are all components that go into trauma-informed care. And you want to really be have those clear expectations about what you're going to do. I always say, don't make promises. You know, make sure that you follow through on things that you say you're going to do because that's going to lessen the stress for the person. And they get a sense that you talked about some of these really great things that you can do in the in the session prior to me. So I think it's just a, a great segue into what we can do here. I'm just going to let, talk about this really quickly. We Trauma-informed care is something that we've not always had, and I'm going to go into why it's come to the forefront, but I just wanted, want you to take a look at this particular slide here is for years ago, um, I can say even in my lifetime and all the th places that I've worked, a lot of places, hospitals, nursing homes, schools, mental health programs, homeless programs, all of these things had a non-trauma informed approach. And some of the things that, you know, it was like there's very, very a right or wrong approach was a non-trauma informed care. Um, the need to know basis for info. It's just, we're not, we're only gonna tell you what we really feel you need to know. Um, looking at the things that people do as symptoms or pathology of an underlying disease or illness. One of the things we say for trauma-informed care is that when you're seeing someone engaging in some behaviors that you're unsure of where they came from, is you take a step back and instead of saying, gee, I wonder what's wrong with them, you take a breath and you go, I wonder what happened to them that created this. 
I wonder if their inability to trust me has to do with something they've experienced before. I wonder if they're lashing out while, you know, something's being done is just a reaction to something that happened to them in the past. So that's what we really look at in trauma-informed care is that understanding that people are reacting a lot of the times to the things that happened to them in their past. So we really want to look at things from the scope of the trauma-informed care in this blue area is that what we know is that people can't calm down, they can't relax until they feel safe and stable. They have to know that nothing more is going to happen to them. They also just recognizing that um, sometimes people are doing things, behavior viewed as a solution. I can give you an example of that. When I was working as a substance abuse counselor, I had a young man who was coming to me for, um, he had, well, he had used heroin for a number of years. He stopped the heroin and was now using uh, smoking marijuana a few times a day. And he looked at me one day and he said, I'm not addicted to drugs. And I was like, really? And he goes, no, I'm addicted to not feeling my feelings. And that's that behavior viewed as a solution. For him, the drugs weren't the problem. It was how he felt without the drugs, the things that he remembered, the things that had happened to him in his lifetime. So, you know, just pondering some of these things and recognizing that when we let people participate in their treatment, when we let them, you know, when we're transparent and we're predictable, when we can look at people and go, yeah, that really makes sense that you would do that if you've experienced some trauma in the past. So like I said, we haven't always talked about trauma and just, you know, briefly, you know, really started really talking about it during Vietnam War. That's when they came up with the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Then in the late 90s, we, 1990s, we were able to start tracking in the brain through functional magnetic resonance imaging where things were happening in the brain. And so they could see that the brain had a place where some of these activations would happen. I mentioned two books here, Bessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score, and Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman. Both excellent books, and I would highly recommend having them in your library. Primarily because um, trauma and recovery, I love it how Judith Herman talks about the need for a safe and stable, safe person to be safe and stable, and then they need to be in relationship that's safe, and then they may be able to tell their story, but we don't want to push them telling their story too soon. So we also want to understand what is trauma? Mm, it's It's these events and circumstances that can include the actual or extreme threat of psychological or physical harm, and it could be natural disasters, violence, life-threatening neglect, all of these things, but it also depends on the person's experiences of the event, okay, because the same thing can happen to two different people, and given how much resilience they've already built up in their life, how much support they may have had in their life, whether or not they had that person they could go to, a safe person while they were growing up, that's going to um, have an impact on how much that trauma is going to follow them through the rest of their life. Okay, so we just, we can't say, you know, if... I experienced a car accident and somebody else experienced a car accident, but I've got supports. I can get a, I can get a um, rental car and I've got people I can talk to, but somebody who, who's wrecked their car, they're like, I don't know how I'm going to get to work. I've had car accidents before and it's, you know, really messed up my whole life. And so they're going to be in a panic and you're looking at two people who've experienced the same thing but their past is going to dictate how they're responding to it in the moment. 
also some people may not have you may not see things happening right away but they may have a delayed onset of the impact of trauma so i'm very quickly going to um talk about adverse childhood experiences we're hearing more and more about these as we go through it. When I first started working for the coalition in 2009, no one had heard of the adverse childhood experiences study. Now, you know, 13 years later, it's something that we talk about quite a bit. It's a piece of the puzzle. It was a study that was done out in California. It started out as a weight loss program. And what was happening is the doctor was noticing that a lot of people who lost weight were putting the weight back on or they were engaging in other unhealthy behaviors after they lost the weight. And so he started to talk to them about what their lives were like. And he found out that for a very large sample, I don't have the number in my head right now, he found out that there were 10 things that these people had experienced that that were common amongst this group, abuse that fell into the abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction categories, things like childhood abuse, having a parent being abused, uh, having a parent being um, incarcerated, uh, sexual abuse, hunger, all of these types of things. And the more of these things that happen to a child between the age of birth and 18, the greater the impact it would have on their long-term physical health and mental health. Unless there was, like I talked about earlier, some of those supports, that resilience, somebody that they could go to, like an aunt, a grandma, somebody who would really care about them and help take care of them. But we also know that there's some genetic factors that fall into this. It's the impact of trauma can go from generation to generation. I could look here and I won't read all of these, but you can see that there's a number of things that also contribute to the likelihood that somebody has experienced something traumatic in their life and have ended up with post-traumatic stress disorder. And usually the general population, it's about 7% that have post-traumatic stress disorder. But what's really interesting is that people who have been deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq, they have a higher percentage with about 20%. And the more intense their exposure, the higher it is. And then we also have high rates in first responders like police officers and firefighters and EMTs. And then even high, those rates continue in low income women and teenagers in high crime and inner city areas. So it's just recognizing you have no way of knowing with someone that you're working with, all that they may have experienced in their life. And I am of two minds in regards to asking people because sometimes they're gonna tell you and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they don't wanna be defined by their trauma. So they don't want to tell you. Uh, that was another story I heard from a friend of mine. She said there was, she worked with a woman who had been in London during the Blitz during World War II and had experienced a lot of after effects and trauma from that. But as she said to the social worker, I don't wanna be defined by that. Since, since that time, I've done a lot of things that I want people to remember me for, not to remember me as someone who survived the blitz, okay? And so we've, when we first started talking about adverse childhood experiences, we were looking at all of these things up and the top here that are the tree. And then we realized that those things don't exist in a vacuum, that there are roots in poverty, discrimination, violence, poor housing quali quality, affordability, um, community disruption. I see COVID as having been a huge community disruption that we are not going to recognize the impacts for years. But, you know, other things that have been experienced, like living through a war, um, all of these things are going to have an impact on someone, and they're not necessarily up here with the adverse childhood experiences, but they are certainly going to be conditions that could later on create some of these other adverse childhood experiences. 
So what we learned is when they first started talking about adverse childhood experiences, they had this pyramid where it started at the orange. And then over the past few years, they started looking at those social conditions and local context that you saw on the previous side, slide. And then we started looking at generational embodiment and historical trauma. And what happens is it disrupts a person's development. It can even slow down someone's development if they're busy focused on trying to respond to the trauma. And then they may have some impairments. They may adopt some risky behaviors like drug use, overeating, cigarette smoking, number of things that lead to a lot of the social problems and things that we have going on in, in heart disease and things like that that lead people to an early death or a lower quality of life. So we really want to take all of these into consideration as things that could be happening to, you know, someone in the end of life, they've been, they've had all of these things happen in their life at some point. So before I go on, I want to see, are there any questions or comments at this point? I'd want to take a little time to check in with folks. I'm going to look. Hi, Mary McCann. I was just looking in chat. <laughs> All right, if there's no questions, I'm going to move on. Oh, Bobby? go ahead. Bobby? Go ahead. Bobby. Unmute yourself, Bobby. You, you mute. Okay. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, I also volunteer for U.S. Pain Foundation, and evidently um, there's a high correlation between people who have chronic pain mm -hmm. and past trauma. Um, and I don't, yep. I haven't really explored it. Have you heard about that? I have. Um, one of the things that, it, it, how can I put it? This is sort of like my, my own idea about why that is, mm -hmm. is if you think of someone who has spent their life tense and using all of the cortisol that you have to use, all the adrenaline cortisol that are, that is needed in order to help you flee from something that's happening or mm -hmm. all of this in your body's constant, it's gonna wear down. I often talked about it as being like, you're living a life where your foot is on the gas pedal and the brake at the same time. You're just revving that engine constantly and you're eventually gonna wear down the car. And that's where it develops into the chronic pain. So yeah, it's just, I mean, when people are in turmoil, when they're experiencing trauma, they're tensed up and that's going to live in the cells of their body. That's one of the things that Bessel van der Kolk talks about in his book is how trauma lives in the cells of our body. That it's not something that you that is necessarily just a mind memory. It's a body memory that... That's why certain things, the person may not even be able to tell you, more than likely they're not going to be able to tell you that they were triggered or activated. All they're going to know is that suddenly their start, heart started racing or their palms got sweaty or they just surged up in anger and they wanted to just leave the room, but they couldn't think about why that was until later. I've got time, so I'm going to tell you just a little story about what happened with me. I like to tell stories when I'm training because it just helps. When I was two, almost two years old, I was in my grandmother's kitchen, and I unfortunately reached up and pulled a cup of boiling hot coffee down on myself. So I it hit right underneath the chin, went all over, and we were 30 miles from the nearest hospital. They loaded me up in the car. We actually passed the ambulance on the way. We got there and I was in shock and my throat had started to close up. And fortunately, the doctor who was there, I mean, we're talking the mid fifties, fortunately he knew how to intubate. So they intubated me so they could get an airway and I was able to breathe. And I'm able to be with you today. Three or four years later, when I'm five years old, 
my mother goes to put a red hooded sweatshirt, a pullover sweatshirt on me, and it got stuck on, right around my forehead because the neck was too, either I had a large head or, or the neck hole was too small. And I'm inside this sweatshirt and I start to scream. So she takes it off. She tried it again about a week later. Same thing happened. I had a complete and total meltdown. And I remember her looking at me and going, I think this has to do with when you were burned. And it was, it was, if we think about it, when I wasn't able to breathe because of that trauma and all of the times after that, that I was in surgery for skin grafts and being wrapped up like a mummy, as my mother said, to have something over me that told my body I was in danger again. If I can't re breathe, I must be in danger. But I had no recollection of what had happened to me when I was 15 months old, but it was coming up in my behavior when I was five. And that's so important to know because people don't always have that memory. If it happened in childhood or if it happened sometime in their life, they may not be able to tell you. So I, I often have foster parents, social workers, well, we need to find out what the trauma is. Mm, not really. Just be aware that something is causing that. Some trauma is there because if we limit ourselves just to what the person remembers, we may, we may not be a pay, paying attention to something significant, but if we treat everyone as if they're having trauma responses, we won't take things personally and we'll be more aware of how not to, um, how, how we'll be more aware of how to make sure we're providing safety and security for someone. Okay. That was a long answer to a short question, but thank you. Thank you. One of the things I, I also want people to think about is that there's such a thing known as generational trauma. And this, we understood this after a couple of studies that were done on children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, and also on children and grandchildren of people who had been put in camps, Japanese people who had been put in camps in the United States during World War II. They're also looking at this now as, as in indigenous people. My grandfather, was in an Indian boarding school back in 1910. And if you're aware of the indigenous boarding school experience, that, his, that history in our family created that these stress reactions, he grew up to be an alcoholic and that increased the substance abuse in the next generation and anxiety and depression. And that continues just sort of keep going around. I also, I, I often also think of my father came from an Irish background. My, my grandfather was on my mother's side, but my father grew up with an extensive her history of childhood trauma, and he was also a Korean war vet. And so living with a war vet will continue to increase that. So it's really just knowing that sometimes when you're looking at someone and you're saying, okay, something must have happened to you. You also take a deep breath and go, this also could be generational. Something could have happened in past generations. And um, there's some really good books out there that talk about this. And I can't for the life of me remember. Uh, look, actually, I'm turning and looking at my bookshelf. And there's one it called It Didn't Start With You. And it actually was by, um, it was one that, that Oprah and the doctor talked together about. So it's a really good example about how sometimes this trauma starts in past generations and just continues on through. Okay, I talked about all that. All right, so I'm gonna give you a short brain talk. Lisa, how much time do I have? Just, I'll it's, just keep it's 12 oh. how how much Leslie I didn't 15 15 more minutes yep. okay. 
because once I get started, I will just keep going as some people in your audience may be aware. So I just want to just talk about real quickly about what's happening in the brain. We've got this, the, the amygdala hippocampal area. And if some of you are nurses or doctors, please be aware that I am not, and I'm not a neurobiologist. I just know that this portion of the brain is our fight, flight, or freeze response. And that there's the prefrontal cortex that is in charge of our executive functioning. The problem is, is that if we're in this part of the brain, which is our trauma center, our activation, our safety center, all of that in there, if this is working, our executive functioning is not working. They cannot work together. So if you've got someone who is experienced a trauma response, they're going to have a hard time listening and hearing how they're safe. They're going to have a hard time taking directions. They're going to have a hard time remembering things that you've told them. And I know we've all worked with people that, that you tell them something one day and the next day that it's, it's like they never heard you. And partly it could be because they get the trauma response. So getting a diagnosis, a terminal diagnosis, having to make all of those plans. That's why we tell people you know, have a family member or an advocate get with you when you go to the doctor so that you can have somebody else who can hear that information and write it down for you because you're going to go into your trauma center and you're not going to be able to listen to all of that information. So that's why that's recommended because you just sort of shut down. Okay. So this is sort of my definition of trauma. It's that fear, terror, the lack of control is a big part of it. Not having control of when this is going to end or how this is going to happen is going to have a large impact on it. I also, we know about the fight, flight, and freeze responses. Sometimes people just for freeze, it's just they shut down and they're looking off into space. But I also want to talk about the fawn response. Let me look here. A fun response. It's, it's a trauma response that we may not always recognize. But it's when someone is doing everything they can to keep another person happy because they're afraid of the power that person may have over them. Okay? That they will agree to things because they don't want that person upset with them. So I think it's always important that when we're working with people that we understand that there may be a perceived sense of power that you may have over them and they may just be agreeing to things because they want you to be happy with them and they don't want to upset you. And this is based not on who you are, it is based on who they had in their life previously, how important it was to make sure that that person was not upset with them. It's something that we learn in childhood, just going on and on. And, it, you know, sometimes people look at that and they call it codependency. And I say, no, it's not really, because for codependency, it's not about safety. When someone is doing this fawning and trying to meet the needs of the other person, it is because they don't want that other person to hurt them. Okay, and that's a whole, whole different thing. Okay, but again, if you feel that someone is just agreeing to things, you may want to talk to your supervisor or to someone else and say, you know, I don't really feel like this is this person's choice. I think they just feel like they have to do it because we're saying we're recommending it. So you want to be real careful about that. So just basically activations is when someone sees something, hears something that reminds them of the trauma, they're going to respond as if they're in current danger. And so the most important thing that you can do is just offer empathy and support. And if they tell you what had happened to them, really point out that it's really wonderful that they had the courage to tell you. And then understand that after they tell you, they also may be fearful of what you're going to do with that information. Just throwing that out there. I want to also say that 
they are trying to connect. They are trying to feel safe with you. And this is, if they're telling you about what's happened to them, it's going to be very important. Now, I also know that a lot of the people that you are working with and supporting may have dementia, advanced dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, they may have just reached a point in their life where they're not responsive. And I think that's that important part of remembering that the trauma lives in the cells of their body. And so if you've got someone who is reacting to something and it could be be passed. I'm just, I'm stumbling here a moment because I'm remembering a story. When I was volunteering a few years ago, I had this lovely woman that I would go and sit with. And one day um, she was in the day room at the nursing home and she was really agitated. And I was talking to her and I was doing what I like to do when people have have dementias I sort of find out where we are because they're someplace different so I got to make sure I get there with them and where she was was it was a number of years ago and her husband had gone hunting and she was really worried about him and she was like I just don't know when Carl's going to be home I wish Carl would get home and I said okay I will sit here with you until Carl gets home and we're gonna and and that was just something that she needed to have and that was her trauma response. I don't know if something had happened to Carl when he went hunting, but that day, there was something about that day. It could have been the time of year. It could have been, you know, how much sunshine there was, but she was being activated around in a memory that she had had about her husband going hunting. And so my job was not to, of course, tell her that Carl was already dead or all of those things that we're taught not to do with dementia patients, but to say, I am here with you. We're just going to spend some time until Carl gets home, until she got to that point where she was more lucid and she was back, you know, in the present. But it was very important to be there with her through that period. So think about you know, I don't have time for us to have a discussion about this, but I think there's a lot of things in a healthcare setting that can activate a person's trauma response. I think about even with nursing, I brought this up when I was doing a training with staff a few months ago. And excuse me, I just have to say it. Um, so, you know, a lot, a lot of people have to get their medication in suppositories. And for someone who was sexually assaulted in the past, having a suppository given to them could create a panic. It could create them fighting back. And so it's very important that you talk someone through it. Even if you don't think that they can hear you, even if you think that they're, um, that the dementia they don't understand, just do your best to talk them through it that this is what's happening, this is what I'm going to do, those types of things. So anytime you're with someone, you know, letting them know in advance what's going to be happening. It's, you know, if all you're doing is taking their wheelchair and taking them down to the sitting room to look at the bird feeders, it's like, hi, I'm going to be behind you for a couple of minutes. I'm going to be pushing you down the hallway and you just keep talking to them so that they know you're there and you get them down to the room and you say, okay, where do you want to go? Do you want to go to this window or do you want to go to that window? Just to give them some choices so that they feel safe with you. Just to go in and, and say, grab the chair and say, we're going to go down to the day room and look at the birds in the windows. They're going to be like, whoa, who are you and why are we doing this and what's going on? It's that gentle approach, just helping people understand what's going on. And again, if that's not, if, if something's not working, you process that with a supervisor or someone else on staff. One of the things I like to do is because sometimes our trauma response gets activated when we're working with somebody who may be fighting back or who may be yelling at us, who's doing things based on their trauma response, is just take a deep breath. It's the best thing that it really just, okay, 
I'm feeling really stressed out. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I get the sense that you're overwhelmed today. Let's take a deep, 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 deep breath. And sometimes when you're doing it, they'll do it along with you. And it's something that can help both of you. So just recognizing that a trauma responsive framework is recognizing that trauma is not the exception. It's what's been happening. It's we see things that people do as adaptations and not symptoms. It's what they've done in order to adapt to what's happened to them. We see a lot of things as survival strategies and coping mechanisms, like my young man who was using drugs, okay? And really it goes back to that, what's wrong with you versus what's we think about what happened to the person. And I think I just wanna just go here is that being trauma informed allows us to eliminate stigma, particularly about mental health, people and saying, oh, they're just a difficult person. I don't know, you know, they're so hard to work with. It could be, it has to do with trauma. You wanna be able to find everything that you can have to help support you. You want to be able to avoid re-traumatizing someone. And you wanna be able to also look at the role of culture. And that's a whole other training. So I'm not gonna go into that. And you also, when you're doing this work, you have to take care of yourself. And I know Lisa talks about that in trainings. I know you have regular times to talk about self-care because as I've talked about working with someone who's experienced trauma in the past and the reactions that they're going to have to you because of what you may remind them of, by taking care of yourself, you'll be less likely to take those things personally and be able to recognize that what's happened is this person has responded to you because they feel like they may be in danger again, even when that does has nothing to do with you. You're gonna get copies of these. And I think I just came in under a minute. Any, any questions or comments, anything that anybody would like to add? Y'all are so quiet. I know you're tired. You had a yeah. lot today. And they just have the microphones off. That was fantastic. I really appreciate you sharing your personal stories. And uh, I'm sure I enjoyed doing it. It's been, a, it's been a couple of months since I've given a presentation. So it was nice. <laughs> Anybody want to unmute and um, raise their hand? I'm seeing a lot of positive things in the chat. Yeah. Fantastic presentation. Yeah. So much to yeah. uh, absorb and be aware of. A lot of good information. And I have to yeah. say, I'm not tired. I'm invigorated by yeah. this. And I really, um, there, it, it's it's empowering to to have this framework and and to be able to approach things with a different mindset. Definitely. To think of what might come out of approaching it in that way. I like the way you began with it's not your place to unwrap the trauma. It's your place to right. sit with it. That's, that's right. pretty powerful. Yeah. You just and want to provide that place of safety and stability for people. And they may not recognize it right away because it may be so foreign to them. And they may not trust you. But it's going to be really important that you provide that. All right. I'm going to go and let y'all finish up. Maybe Thanks. I'll see you around soon. Thanks, Linda. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Uh, Tanya, I'm going to turn it over to you, I think. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank Linda. I want to thank all of our speakers. Uh, and as, as I was just sitting there sort of reflecting back on the series of presentations that we've had, and I'll invite you to do that too. Um, you know, we've had these three weeks together around our central topic of meeting patients and families where they're at. And we've started each day with some grounding, some talking about presence, um, being vulnerable, being in new situations. Uh, and then we had our conversation about love languages. So just thinking back to what are the different ways that we uh, receive things and give things in our lives and how do others maybe do that differently? And are we matching up in our giving and receiving, uh, both in our personal lives and also in our hospice work? 
Uh, and then we had that great conversation with Susan Lynch um, about grief and also about uh, stigma and how to meet someone um, who has been in a very difficult situation uh, and, and not judge and be able to be present to allow them to go through their process. And I was thinking uh, sort of what related in that conversation to what Linda just shared with us. Um, and then last week, um, we had some great conversations uh, as well. So I, what we'd like to do, we, it's uh, kind of a tradition with this education event to be able to have a ritual to wrap up all of our conversations that are related to this topic. And we'll be creating a word cloud and Leslie's going to help us with the logistics of this. So I just want to invite you to think about all that's been discussed uh, as it relates to meeting patients and families where they're at and what words or phrases come to mind for you uh, in relation to that. And I invite you to put those into the chat now. And if it's a phrase, I think that you have to add a, a little dash between the words with no space in order for that phrase to show up. So this is a brainstorming time. We have a few minutes here where if you would just type words, just kind of don't even think about them, just type them into the chat as quickly as you can think of them. Uh, and if the word has already been there, do it again. Uh, so because uh, our words in our word cloud will be weighted as bigger if more people think of that word. So uh, just throw those in one at a time, if you would, into the word cloud. And if it's a phrase, put a little dash between it. So I'm going to give everybody a, a couple minutes to, to just do that in silence. Let me clean these up and then I will get right to your cloud. So as um, Leslie will need just a moment to, to make this all magically happen behind the scenes. So as she's doing that, I just want to remind you that you will receive another follow-up email today with the link from today's recording and also the various handouts and uh, different tools that were mentioned will be included in that email. And so you have access at any time to go back to the Alliance website and review or revisit any of the content that you've seen over the last three weeks. Uh, and it's really important to us, if you would please, to complete the evaluations for any of the sessions that you've attended. So I know paperwork is never anybody's favorite part, <laughs> but it's that little cleanup thing and it really does help us. Um, so speaking from the committee uh, of volunteer coordinators who has taken the time to put this event on for you, um, we pay attention to those evaluations and we're really interested in what you have to say there in trying to make future uh, education events uh, even better. And this is such a unique thing that the New Hampshire Alliance does because it doesn't cost volunteers anything to participate in this. So it's actually um, your individual organizations who have signed you up for this opportunity and I just wanna to mention too, that it doesn't hurt to go back maybe to your organization, either through your volunteer coordinator or through any of the, the leadership in that organization to say thank you to them for having volunteers participate in this. So if you let them know that this has actually been valuable content, that this has actually um, allowed you to engage with volunteers from around the state, uh, and to have conversations that you might not have been able to have otherwise, it's really uh, great and important for them to get that feedback. All right, Leslie, how are we doing? We're doing really good. Okay. All right, here. I'll also just mention you've probably received this from your coordinators, but we do have the clinical conference for the Home Care Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance. It's the annual Hospice and Palliative Care conference um, and this is back in person this year in Concord in November. With so a volunteer if, rate. Mm -hmm. And so there is a volunteer rate 
um, you get to go for less than our, our clinical companions. And that's a great day too. So if you're interested in that, make sure you look that up on the Alliance website and consider participating. Okay, you ready for this? All right, we're ready. Listen. And the word cloud in the, in the follow-up as well, right? Yes. Yes. Nice. Yeah, this is such a great wrap up to kind of pull it all together. Yeah, and um, I wonder if this is we already figured that out. So we want to thank you all for participating. Uh, if you have any questions to Leslie when she gives you the follow up email or to go through your volunteer coordinators, um, but we hope that this has been, uh, it's really your participation that makes this worthwhile. Thank you.